Experience five days of live music, from Mark Ronson and the BBC Concert Orchestra to the Chemical Brothers and Kaiser Chiefs. Go to bbc.co.uk forward slash electric proms. All the reaction to the weekend's misfortunes and the build-up to Sunday's NFL match at Wembley. Inside Sports at 11.15. With some strong language now on BBC One, the British film that made a big noise. I think the film introduced a whole new audience to brass band music. You had to see Ewan McGregor playing a trumpet, it suddenly became a bit cool. Fantastic ensemble piece of work. Witty, pathetic, pathetic, horrendous, cruel, hard. Just phenomenal, really. There's so much humour in it, so you found yourself one minute you were like in tears, the next minute you were you were laughing really because of the the way that the northern northerners get through things, you know, that with humour. It's the, the one piece of work I'm most proud of, and I think I knew it at the time. I actually thought I was playing, and when we took the bow at the end there, I had a big lump in my throat, as if I'd actually played. I really thought I'd played that instrument, <laughs> which is really weird. Released in 1996, Brassed Off is a film filled with unforgettable moments and one of the most moving endings in British movie history. It was tremendous being there, watching Pete do that speech. It was fantastic. And we, uh, we didn't tell the extras what the speech was going to be, so we set up a couple of cameras on, on reactions first. Um, so a lot of those reactions in that final scene are, are genuine extras' reactions to a speech they're hearing for the first time. This band behind me will tell you that that trophy means more to me than out else in the whole world. But they'd be wrong. The truth is, I thought it mattered. I thought that music mattered. But does it bollocks? Mark came to me that morning, he said, oh, it's a big day, you know, it's a big day. And it was a big day. And he said, um, I'm not gonna go for rehearsal, camera rehearsal or anything like that. We're gonna, you, you know, I know you know it. You know the speech, don't you? I said, yes, I do. I know it. He said, well, I want you to do it. I'm not gonna tell anybody on the set what you're gonna say. Neither the band, nor any of the extras, nor anybody. A fortnight ago, this band's pit were closed. Another thousand men lost their jobs. They can knock out a bloody good tune. But what the fuck does that matter? Everyone in the entire Albert Hall was just moved to tears. And it was one of the most incredible things I've ever been part of. Brassed Off is about a northern colliery brass band competing in the national championships in London, while London, in the shape of the Conservative government, is helping destroy their community. Within a decade, over 250,000 mine workers lost their jobs through pit closures. But how do you sell a story about ruin and despair, plus that ultra-British institution, the Brass Band, to a worldwide audience? You start by making it a comedy, with Tara Fitzgerald and Ewan McGregor as the romantic interest, then hiring a producer who'd worked with that other ultra-British institution, the Monty Python team, before moving on to the international hit, A Fish Called Wanda. Please have been developing Wanda, which I subsequently that became the first prominent feature and my first individual producer credit. Um, Terry Jones was making Eric the Viking, preparing that rather. Terry Gilliam was preparing the adventure of Baron Munchausen, and, and we sort of pooled our resources and formed and formed prominent um, as a vehicle for all of us. And uh, we did rather well early on. It meant that I had, as a producer, pretty decent calling card in Hollywood. 
Steve Abbott had the Hollywood connections, but he had the Yorkshire ones too, with Bridlington-born Mark Herman, who had won critical acclaim for his short film See You at Wembley, Frankie Walsh. Their first collaboration, the farcical comedy Blame It on the Bellboy, had a star cast, including Dudley Moore, a Venice backdrop and the backing of the Disney empire. What it didn't have was an audience, and the critics blamed it on the writer-director. Blame It on the Bellboy wasn't a success, and uh, I don't think it was quite as bad as everybody else tells me it is, but uh, Steve Abbott sort of stuck with me. And I, I spent those few years writing what I thought were um, quite commercial scripts, but nobody... Nobody took them up. So the advice to me was to just write something I care about. And that's where Brass Tough came. With one dud under their belts, Herman and Abbott had to look closer to home to find funding for Brass Off. Channel 4 Films agreed to provide half the budget, and Herman and Abbott were prepared to sell their soul to the devil to find the extra two million. When a notorious American producer put his hand in his pocket, some thought they had. It came from New York, came from Harvey Weinstein, Miramax. And to get that, that backing without any, you know, American casting or without having to put Brad Pitt in the pit, you know, um, it was it was great, you know, for him just to, just to believe in the story that much that he, he he thought he could sell that story in America without Americanizing it. Harvey Weinstein was known in the industry as Harvey Scissorhands after rumours of him grabbing directors' cuts of films and fine-tuning them. But he was also famous for spotting and supporting future hits like Pulp Fiction, Muriel's Wedding and True Romance. Now Brassed Off was in his grip. Oh, Harvey's as complete softy as a pussycat. And Harvey was constant in what he said to me, which was, all your friends tell, will tell you I'm a monster, and Harvey says a hands or whatever, and, um, you know, I'll leave you alone. And he did. He never interfered with our script, with our casting, and he never saw the film until after we'd, uh, we'd cut negative. With Harvey Weinstein's benign and twinkling blessing, writer-director Mark Herman was given free reign to cast Brast off himself. Usually when I write a script, I have all sorts of actors' pictures on the wall while I'm writing, and then none of them end up in the film, usually. Uh, in this case, Pete Bosselthwaite was, uh, was on my wall, and he's the, he was the one survivor that got into the film. My political sympathies um, were exactly captured in the film Brastoff, um, what I felt about um, what that government did. Pete Postlethwaite had supplemented his income as a theatre actor with appearances in TV dramas and sitcoms like Watching. How did he get on the force? I'm twice the man he'll ever be, even with my eyes. It's just not fair. Come on, Stuart. But it was in the name of the father as Giuseppe Conlon that brought Postlethwaite to Hollywood's attention. It led to another police lineup in The Usual Suspects in 1995, before Postlethwaite was handed the baton, the plum jacket and plum roll of brassed off single-minded conductor Danny Ormondroyd. When you're asked to do something that fits in not only with what you feel politically, but spiritually and theatrically in terms of your career and what you want to do, which is act, then it's form and content coming together and you just think, that's, that's what I want to do. We did a casting session with Kate Winslet and Catherine Zeta-Jones, which is amazing to look back and you know, to think back that we had those two in the same room and uh, didn't cast either of them. With Hollywood's A-list kicked into touch, they looked for a comely Yorkshire lass and found one from Sussex. Tara Fitzgerald had delighted audiences especially male ones, in and often out of costume dramas, like The Chamomile Lawn and films like Sirens in 1994. As Gloria, Fitzgerald was the siren with a flugelhorn in the colliery band. I mean, cast Tara because, because she's, um, I, I felt, was the most nat natural actress. And uh, didn't, I mean, she, wasn't, she, she didn't bring enormous silly beauty to it. She was, a very, she was very much a girl next door. Uh, I hope this doesn't offend Tara, but it's, uh, that's, that's the reason. Cast as the boy next door, the Scottish actor Ewan McGregor was also easy on the eye, if not on the ear. He tells everybody he can play French horn. Um, I didn't really, I, I couldn't detect that when, it, when he played it for me. <laughs> had just shot train spotting. Uh, 
and I saw some rushes from train spotting, and I thought he was going to be big news. Uh, so I cast him and, and met him and you know, really liked him. He, again, he, he felt passionately about the story, uh, so we cast him. Ewan McGregor went from train spotting's drug addled Renton to Brastoff's lovelorn Andy, where all he stuck in his mouth was a tenor horn. Stephen Tompkinson was famous as Drop the Dead Donkey's Damien, who gave bad news a worse name. God had the last laugh when Tomkinson was cast as Father Clifford in Ballykiss Angel. Ah, oh, Father, welcome to Ballykiss Angel. Lads, this is our new priest. How are you doing, Father? Pleased to meet you. Given the chance to make his movie debut as Pete Postlethwaite's son, Phil, the full-time miner and part-time clown, Stephen was overwhelmed. I'd gone from sort of having my elbow on the desk and looking completely to, like, with my head lying on the desk, just in shock. Um, because I wasn't quite sure what what Mark had seen on TV that had made him think that's the person for me, but whatever it was, the, the enormity of it hit me. And, uh, yeah, I ended up nearly passed out in front of him on his desk. With Steve, it was quite clear that he that he understood it. He was desperate to do, the, do this part, and he really, you know, he grabbed it by the neck, I think. And he, he, it was his first feature film part, I think. And uh, he was tremendous in it. It was a real eye-opener for a lot of people, I think. Give me some money. But it's saddle with. I mean, Dad'll kill me if I don't turn up. Uh, and I will if you do. <laughs> Ain't life just shit? <laughs> On your head, Dad. Cast as Sandra, Phil's long-suffering wife, Melanie Hill was used to the world of dysfunctional families. Oh, ma'am. What would we all do if there wasn't you? This house is like a little church, all warm and welcoming. And you, ma'am, you are the altar. By 1989, she'd become a regular in Carla Lane's sitcom, Bread, playing wannabe glamour model, Aveline. My character, Sandra, is uh, married to Steve Tompkinson in the film and they've got, obviously got money worries and they've been through one strike and um, it's, it's all very tough and she ends up doing a runner on him, which I must say, when I watched it again the last time, I was really mad with myself for leaving him because I think she should have stuck around. But then again, there was no furniture and it was obviously hard and she had the kids to think about, so I guess that's why she left him. Don't be a pillock all your life. Take money while it's still on offer. Hey, there's a lot of folk out there wouldn't like to hear where you're talking, love. Ah, uh, and they're all as daft as you are. All end up winning out, just like us. Philip! Oh, late for practice. We'll talk about it later, eh? Later? You'll still be saying later when we're out on bloody street. One of my favourite bits in the film was when I had to sh throw the um, plate at Steve and, and Pete Postlethwaite, and I had to do that about 25 times, and it was really good fun, screaming, you know, chucking a plate. Do it bigger! You have a wife and four bloody kids in a house nobody will bloody buy, mortgage up to the bloody hills, loan sharks on our backs, no bloody money, no bloody job, and what are you going to do? Fucking juggle! Bit clumsy with the crockery, old Sandra. The band was completed by actors who could be relied on not to hit a bum note. Before playing Marxist firebrand Jim in Brastoff, Philip Jackson's film roles included prison officer Greaves in Scum. Peter Martin was the skipper in Funny Bones in 1995, before taking up the tuba as wise-cracking Ernie. And Harry, the whiz on the euphonium, was the versatile Jim Carter. The Titanic-like story of playing on in the face of disaster couldn't have been closer to the Grimethorpe Colliery Band. Their own pit had closed in 1993. Mark and Steve Abbott, producer, thought it'd be great if we could have some of the real band members, you know, maybe should we ask them and see if we might get three or four of them who'd want to be in the film. And 27 of them said they wanted to be in the film. So to get 24 more uniforms. And in fact, that whole band was the band, was the Grimethorpe Band. Who again were Quite extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. It was just an honour to be part of these incredible musicians and also to 
you know, pump them for information about, uh, you know, the background to the story and, and what it means, uh, what the band means to the community as well. They were invaluable and they had to do a lot of acting in it as well and they were terrific. Quite intimidating because these people, you know, they can play and play well. So actually sitting in there not knowing what to do at all and Pete seemed to already have got it together uh, conducting and he was doing very well so we just, uh, we were sort of winging it really. That's what that was. A load of bloody crap. Most of those times you see them, our actors playing in the film, there's an awful noise coming out of the instrument they're, they're playing, but the, the actual finger work is very accurate. And, uh, and that was interesting, because you watch the, 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 the band watching the actors, and, and they suddenly realise the actors do quite a lot of work. Uh, for, I mean, Tara did an enormous amount of work working out the finger work. Uh, and when she played that, in front of men, I, th I think they were amazed by it. When the sound was terrible, but they, but it looked exactly right. I just sung the, the tune, like when we was at the Albert Hall, or we we, um, we did William Tell Overshow, didn't we? So consequently, you had to get and it looked nobody could hear it but me, but that's how I, and then I would just do the fingering. And that, that and they try to make it look as 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 as, uh, as 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 natural as possible. There's something about brass band music that's got a certain hits a certain note that other music doesn't, and it automatically becomes makes people sort of go a bit bleary eyed and look look into the distance. <laughs> conflict between local mining communities, the government and subsequent pitched battles with the police left a bitter taste and lingered in the public conscience. Three years after the closure of Grimethorpe Colliery, the locals were weary of any media intrusion. Brastoff's cast and crew needed to tread very carefully. I had talked to Steve Abbott and Mark and said, look, you know, it's not fair to just actually swan in to Grimethorpe and pretend to be Danny Ormondroyd without a couple of weeks prior actually living up there before the film starts and stuff like that. And Steve Tompkinson heard about this or knew about that, or we talked about it and said, I want to do that with you. So we did. I've never seen an actor sink themselves into a part quite, quite as passionately as he did on that. Um, he went up to Grimethorpe early, a couple of weeks, uh, in the working men's club there, researching. And you'll be carried on doing research after you finish filming. <laughs> there was an odd reaction from the locals there. We found out that um, a news crew had been up to do a, a report on what had happened to Grindthorpe since the pit closed down, and it was a bit of a hatchet job. So the, the locals were a bit reticent that another film crew were coming up to do a story about them and were they going to be stitched up again. Despite their best intentions, there were still pockets of resistance to the movie from sections of the Grimethorpe community. In the film, there was a, a fish shop, which was an empty shop, but the, the producers and the, and the people, the film people, made it into a fish shop. And I think they called it In Cod We Trust, which was a wonderful name, wasn't it? And uh, every morning we would come back and the windows had been put in. Now, this happened for quite a while until they thought, all right, lads, so they got the chipper, the, the, the joint, and said, every night, put boards up. So some wise little person decided to drill through the wood and smash the glass anyway. Now, that's how bad it got, you see. I remember November the 5th, there were some little kids hanging about, and we said, oh, what, are, you, are you having a bonfire tonight? And uh, one of them said, no, we're going to burn corp down. <laughs> we sort of laughed at that. Came back next morning, co-op was in, well, had been in flames, so it was completely burnt down. But you said, we're going to burn co-op down. It was mad. <laughs> My production office was at the old colliery offices. They'd, they'd levelled the colliery. 
uh, as soon as the, you know, the instruction to close came. So that was very bittersweet. We were making the film, you know, we had to design the winding gear because everything had been leveled. So that was a, you know, that was a prop. But we were actually making the film on the old colliery offices. We reconstructed what, how we imagined it would look. Um, and there were locals there who were quite shocked when they, when they walked down the street. It, it, it brought back such memories to them. I think you know, a few of them were quite upset that we, you know, we had got it done you know, so accurately that it, it reminded them of the, of the day that the pit closed. The number of people that you talked to who just went, oh, my God, that brings it all back. You know, they could actually hear the feet going down the cobbled streets again and all that, and the times of day were all linked to shift changes, to all this, and this icon of what was their community was back in place. As they realised that we were on their side, and not against them, they came round and, and accepted us. Uh, and now, I think, if you go to Grindthorpe, there's pubs with Pete Posh drunk here, Ewan McGregor played Snooker here, and, and, they're, and they're very proud of it now, but they weren't at first, believe me. The men in Brastoff hide behind their musical instruments to avoid facing the awful reality of the pit closure, but the women confront it head on. All right, love. That's it, you bugger off and blow your bloody trumpet. Blimey, a conversation. Harry, in a month's time when you're at home all day and there's now but doll coming in, at least I can sit there too and know that I did summit. It weren't much, but it was best I could do, and at least it was summit. I thought it was quite clever, even though the men got more airtime. The, the bits that the women, the, the way we were portrayed, we, were, we supported each other, we helped each other, and there was a little scene with Sue Johnson and I where she palmed me a fiver, even though she was skinned. And it's just, you, you know, they, they were there in the background, just supporting their men. Sorry, Vera. Me and Sums, you know, not what you call best of friends. Me and money, total friggin' strangers. I tell you what, give it us next week, all right? Are you sure? Don't forget your receipt. The scene between Vera and Sandra in, in the local shop where, where she slips some, some money. That, when you write it in the script, um, it doesn't, doesn't read very well. It always, it, it can go, you can read through the script and not really notice it. But I know as a writer-director, I know that when we get to that scene, that's going to be one of the most powerful scenes in the, in the film. And for me, it's probably my favourite favorite moment. There was always that bit of the guys being in the car and going past the women who were there protesting all the time. And, you know, so... The fight was, was equal between husbands and wives. Poor old biddies. Don't they know they're pissing in the wind like the rest of us? Can they do that, women? What? Piss in the wind. No, honey, that's just the point. Turn over. Turn over. Six, take one. And play back. The actors playing the band members were skilled enough to make their characters real. And as the obsessive Danny Ormondroid, Pete Postlethwaite delved into his own background for inspiration. The character of Danny was Danny Ormondroid. I mean, listen to the name, Danny Ormondroid. Couldn't be from anywhere else but from around Grimethorpe, that area. Um, Danny resonated with me straight away because um, as a kid growing up in Warrington, which I did, which is Lancashire, not Yorkshire, but growing up in Warrington and going to, um, to Real, to North Wales for holidays, brass bands were our lives. Brass bands were a celebration of our lives. I like the band. I love the band, we all do. But there's other things in life, you know, that's more important. Not in mine, there isn't. Danny's kind of in a world of his own, really, he's a dreamer. He's, he's doesn't want to have confront reality. He doesn't want to acknowledge the fact that there's a political agenda in what's going on. And for you have to get somebody, an actor, who can do that without making him seem seem a complete fool, you know. And you do completely sympathise with Danny, even though he's a sentimental fool and he's only interested in his music. Pete's just finished one of these coffin fits, and for the first time, the sun sees the stain on the hanky and without it being said knows that his father could be dying. What's that on your hanky? Eh? Oh no. Chain come off my bike. Stephen's character and Stephen's 
work on the character actually inspired and made me dig down into deeper depths about what what is this relationship i thought steve was tremendous in the film steve and pete together worked amazingly together um and i think um their relationship went to, to make it so moving, really, because there was that great respect and love there between them, as well as everything going on around them. I think he did a tremendous job. Phil's respect for his father, his political idealism and reluctance to face reality meant he was doomed, and swapping pit boots for big clown shoes suggested he was on the edge. And when the loan sharks came a-calling, he was just about ready to topple over. Told you, pal! It's crazy! The Mr... Chuckles' character was that the, the the one enormous garish spa, splash of colour in the whole movie, uh, and again didn't fit quite because Phil was hopeless at it, um, and it was it was just uh, it highlighted his desperation, and it was it was yeah it was all sort of tragedy comic at the same time. So God was creating man, all right. And his little assistant came up to him and he said, Hey, we've got all these bodies left, but we're right out of brains, we're right out of hearts, and we're right out of vocal cords. And God said, Fuck it, sew them up anyway, smack smiles on their faces and make them talk out their asses." And lo, God created the Tory party. It was, uh, yeah, one of the most memorable pieces of the film for me it was his gradual dissension into, you know, culminating in him trying to commit suicide. Although how, how he got up there in those boots, I've no idea. <laughs> Blast Off is really about the, the um, triumph of the spirit in, over, over adversity. Um, and a lot of the stories I, I work on, a lot of the film scripts I've worked on, uh, those are the ones I care about most, where it's, you know, ordinary people in, in extraordinary situations. What the bloody hell were you playing at, that? You lost your marbles? Maybe I've lost everything else. Wife, kids, house, job, self-respect, hope. But then that's now, is it, Dad? Because it's music that matters. Mark's ability to structure a piece for film is just astonishing, and uh, and 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 there's no, no one else can take any credit for that. He knows exactly; uh, he can write scenes that are, are just wonderfully succinct. What's your name? Gloria. Gloria Stitz. Eh? Gloria Stitz. <laughs> <laughs> the way you know my character relates to. His wife and that is actually quite old-fashioned, sort of what you now call male chauvinist sort of attitude. His wife and that, and you know, as soon as somebody who looks like Tara Fitzgerald turns up, they get all sort of giggly and sort of became, become like little kids, you know. I'm a surveyor. Um, what you mean, like a quantity surveyor? Kind of. Want to survey my quantity, though? <laughs> well, I do say no job too small. <laughs> Get away, love. Take your bloody fortnight, this one. <laughs> <laughs> the butt of male innuendo after she joins the brass band, it looks like Gloria will get the last laugh. Unknown to anyone, she's the enemy within. She's management. In terms of the Ewan McGregor and Tara Fitzgerald relationship, the love relationship that occurs between two long-lost lovers, in a way. I mean, they were together at school and stuff like that was a fantastic device, I think. Um, very, very clever piece of film writing, whereby you get two people who had grown up in the same area, who had actually had a fling together, you know, top half only, of course, um, that now seem to be on opposite sides of the divide. Um, they seem to be, but there's still that free song between them. There's still, and why not? I mean, Tara is absolutely, gorgeously attractive, and. Ewan's pretty good looking too, I suppose. Do you want to come up for a coffee? I don't drink coffee. I haven't got any. The love story was a nice, uh, a nice part of the story, but when he thought she was part of management, 
he came over to the miners. So his respect and his admiration and his love for his fellow worker was probably a little bit stronger than his affection for her. Gloria Mullins. Love of me bloody life walks into practice hall. Bloody hell, I thought maybe life's not so bad. But is it buggery? She's only fucking management. And now that's what you've been doing. A lot of people think uh, Brastov's about the strike, but it's, not, it's nothing to do with the strike, it's to do with the closures. And those stories were very different. Because you know, at the time, every, everybody in the country knew about the miners' strikes, but not many people knew about the closures when they were happening. And that's what interests me about the, the story, the fact that all these pits have been closed and all these communities have been affected without it ever really being on the news. You coming for a pint, mate? Drink with scabs, do you? I voted for money. You know that? Come on, Phil, lad, stop being a bloody drama queen and come and have a wet with us. Anyway, there's enough bloody rubbish in this canal already. When they said rap for the whole thing, I was just broke down for about half an hour, three quarters of an hour, completely inconsolable. I remember Jim Carter and Phil Jackson trying to sort of pick me up, and that made it worse. So, it was, uh, yeah, it was... Um, I've never experienced anything like that before or since. Made by a Yorkshireman, in Yorkshire, one of Brastoff's first screenings was in front of the toughest audience imaginable. The most nerve-wracking screening, actually, after we finished filming, was um, we, had a, we had a screening in Barnsley. And uh, to me, that was much more important than showing it to the funders. Was it? it was actually to show it to the people of Barnsley. And, you know, if it went down badly there, then uh, we'd be in the right mess. I was uh, surprised at the reaction from the audience, the, the laughter. And then, you know, as it progressed, you could audible, there were audible <laughs> Oh, it was great. Um, so I thought, yeah, the, the, this could be a big success if, if it becomes a people's film, a word of mouth film. And that's, that's kind of what happened to it. The fact that the band thought it was right, thought it was a good film, I think was the best review we could have had, you know. Brastoff's world premiere was at the glittering Leeds Film Festival. There wasn't a dry pair of lips in the house as the guests of honour were introduced. The world famous Brian Thorpe Colliery Band. Brastoff was released in the UK on November the 1st, 1996. Within a month, it had taken three million pounds at the box office. A huge thumbs up from the public for a low budget film about a colliery band. Suddenly, it developed a momentum three or four weeks in and it was still playing. And in one theatre, in Yorkshire, I hasten to add, it was still playing six months on when the video came out and the run finally came to an end. When we were filming it, I had no idea it would be, it would be as big as it was, really. Um, and, I, you know, it was, it was a shock, but every... People come up to me now, and it's, what, it's 11 years ago now, and they come up and say, you know, I absolutely love Brastoff, and, th you know, it touched a lot of people's hearts, really. But would it work in the States? That was the $4 million question for the American investors. The little movie about pit closures needed a big, successful opening. We tested it on, 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 on highly intelligent and literate New York audiences who'd got no idea about the idea of nationalised industry, and why should they? Uh, no sense of political history. And it really, you know, we had to sort of, um, you know, lead them by the hand a bit just to give them some background, because they were bewildered as to what film they'd walked into. We had to put new uh, an opening title sequence on, which explained who Margaret Thatcher was, and what a pit was, <clears throat> those kind of things. With the weight of Harvey Weinstein and the Miramax marketing machine behind it, Brastoff was launched, though maybe not in the right direction for the filmmakers. He was selling the film in America as a love story between Ewan and Tara, and uh, we didn't feel it was that. We didn't even agree with the, with the title he used in, um, in America. It's Brastoff with an exclamation mark, which, you know, was never what we called it here. And um, we very bravely, given, uh, given the bargain we'd struck, said, sorry, this isn't working for us. And he listened. But alas, um, the North American theatrical release was, um, 
was the least successful of all our foreign releases. Certain cities in America get it, but then in LA, it's just like a film from Mars. You know, they just really didn't, didn't understand what it was about. Though falling flat in the States, Brassed Off, a tragedy with a seam of comedy running through it, was an international success, winning Best Film Awards in France, Germany and Japan. When I wrote it, and even when we shot it, I, I never thought it would travel. I didn't think the film would travel. I didn't think anybody would, you know, outside a radius of about five miles from Barnsley would really understand it. Um, so it was very re rewarding to see it go through Europe and even to Japan and, you know, to see, see it had a global uh, interest as well, which is fantastic. Steve Abbott put on extra clothes and headed for the mountains with his old python pal to make Himalaya with Michael Palin. Mark Herman stuck with the northern comedy circuit with his film version of the play, Little Voice. They were looking for a writer-director. Similar, it was a similar area, sort of music, comedy, tragedy, and uh, uh, I think I fitted that bill at that time, so uh, it was a natural film to follow Brast off. In 2000, Herman adapted and filmed Purely Belter before directing Colin Firth and Minnie Driver in Hope Springs. Ewan McGregor stayed on with the team, appearing in Little Voice alongside Philip Jackson before playing the young Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars The Phantom Menace. Back on planet Yorkshire, Melanie Hill, Phil's long-suffering wife in Brast Off, scored as Rita in Playing the Field. From luckless Phil in Brast Off, Stephen Tompkinson went on to play feckless Jim Dixon in the TV version of Lucky Jim. By 2006, Tompkinson was in the heart of Africa playing a suburban vet, reinventing his life in Wild at Heart. Pete Postlethwaite put down the baton to take on the pterodactyls in Jurassic Park, before working with Ewan McGregor on The Serpent's Kiss in 1997. One way or another, the band has come a long way from the night at the Albert Hall. The time of making the film it was one of the best experiences. Um, every form, content, everything coming together, everything you want to do, everything you believe in, everything you think is why you wanted to be in this business in the first place is all there and it's all up on the screen. I was very moved, I was very proud and I, I, I found it very funny as well so it was all loads of things going through my head but I was just really proud to be part of it to be honest and I still am. I'm amazed that we're sitting here talking about Brast off you know, 12 years after the event. Uh, we certainly didn't think that at the time. I thought we were making a film about Yorkshire people, but in fact you're making a film about humanity. In my career, Brast off's the thing uh, that I'm most proud of. Being from the north and living through the, the miners' strike, it, it always hit, hit home to me, that, that whole sort of part of British social history. It's the film I do want to be most associated with, I think, because, you know, because of the message, because of the Yorkshire connection. And there wasn't anything that sort of speaks to the, the soft inner Yorkshireman's heart in the same way that Brastoff did. I always said I wanted to be on the big screen. And we all went to see it on the big screen, and tears were streaming down my boy's face. He said other people won't maybe understand this, Dad, but my dad's on that big screen, you know, and so, Brastoff was a, was, a, was a real high spot in my life, yeah. It's... Uh, it's what you dream of, it's what, it's what you live for, it's, it's what it is all about. It's what drives you, it's what, it's what you love. Get inside sports next on BBC One. And for details of the latest movie releases, including Matthew Vaughan's family fantasy Stardust, which sees Michelle Pfeiffer, Claire Danes, and Robert De Niro among a stellar lineup, hit red now for BBC Movies. This year, BBC News correspondent Alan Johnston was kidnapped in Gaza. 
This Thursday, in his own words, he talks about his 114-day ordeal. It's just a devastating thing, and you realise that many people around the world might well feel that you were dead. And eventual release. It was just the most extraordinary moment of my life. Kidnapped, the Alan Johnston story, a Panorama exclusive, Thursday at 9 on BBC One. Holiday so cheap, it's a steal.